I'm going to start introducing this film. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's been a pleasure to be invited and you're in for a real treat. So well done on you. <laughs> Hyenas from 1992. I'm going to start with a question. Who amongst us has experienced debt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, debt. <laughs> a real debt though. Not the debt of a friendly fiver here or there, or even the blessed fortune of a loved one, sharing resources with no expectation of return. I'm talking about the kind of debt that prison was invented for. Mm -hmm. To be in debt is to exist in a state of owing, a state of being that clouds your thoughts, shapes your actions, and shapes the course of your life. A precarity so profoundly controlling, it was wielded as one of the sharpest tools by Western imperialists in the post-colonial period. See, the thing about debt, whether it's intentionally wielded as a tool of oppression or not, is that it exerts a moralizing force very few have historically objected to. An eye for an eye. To make good on your debts. To owe a debt of gratitude. To pay one's debt to society. All debts must and shall be repaid, or so goes the accepted wisdom. In the opening of debt, the first 5,000 years, American anthropologist and activist David Graeber opens with an old American proverb. If you owe the bank $100,000, the bank owns you. If you owe the bank $100 million, you own the bank. $100,000 million, in fact, is what Linge Aramatu, prodigal daughter of Koloban, offers the town and its people in the far-fetched and far-reaching masterpiece of African cinema we're about to experience. In exchange, Linge Aramatu asks the town to make her debtors pay what she believes she is owed. The naming of this debt is the real jump-off point in Mambete's second and final feature, which wraps a parable in a tragic comedy in the director's own birthplace to pose the question, who owns Africa and its people? Africa, where the majesty inherent in the land is epitomized in the film's opening shot, a parade of elephants, nature's largest land mammal. Only the cradle of civilization can boast life on such a grand scale. But this grandeur is soon undercut by the posturing and feather ruffling of the characters we meet in the first act of the film. Fuss pots with no pot to piss in, window dressing their steady decline with symbolism and promises as lasting as the desert rain. A dilapidated colonial era hotel is draped in tinsel for a public address. And here I believe we see Mambete dismantling the Africans' predilection for looking to the past, even as they seek to embrace the future. We will also see symbolism employed with all the finesse of history's finest filmmakers. An Umushayayo dancer performs the movement of animals which grace the land. But a trail of electric pylons snakes across the backdrop, underscoring the emptiness of a place that has no electricity of its own. Cultural heritage becomes in that moment the thin veil separating the people of Koloban from the animals that same traditional practice evokes. Mambete, 20 years after his paradigm shifting Tukibuki, has honed his storytelling craft to a fine point. The avant-garde African expressionism of his debut feature gives way to a more staid, creeping use of frames, each weaving a pressure and complexity into the passage of time in the world he has manifested for posterity. At Draman's grocery bar in one early sequence, the shopkeeper, his wife, and a band of penniless troubadours are slowly stirred in a psycho psychosocial cocktail of pride, self-deprecation, generosity, greed, gullibility, exploitation, all this contradiction in the simple act of pouring a drink. 
Mambete is mirroring the heady mix of social relations still observable in the African peri-urban communities you and I could step into today. It's in the play of personalities that all good stories are unwound. And who better to play politics with personhood than the scorned Linger Ramatou, outcast in her youth, who has now returned richer than the World Bank to exact her debt, informed and inspired by the architects of the global financial system. It's the same critique of class power that informed the visit, the Swiss dramaturge Friedrich Dürrenmatt, the play from which this film is adapted. But rather than critique the Marshall Plan, which is a rarely discussed prototype of foreign aid for Europe, shock horror, Mambete sets his sights on the structural adjustment programs corroding the continent, which use debt and Western politics to whittle the spirit of Africa away from her mineral rich core. If we had the time of a Thursday evening, we could digress into the history that Graeber provides to frame how global debt systems continue to demoralize African sovereignties. We could look at how, and I quote, during the 70s oil crisis, OPEC countries ended up pouring so much of their newfound riches into Western banks that the banks couldn't figure out where to invest the money. How Citibank and Chase therefore began sending agents around the world, trying to convince third world dictators and politicians to take out loans. At the time, this practice was called go-go banking. We could look at how they started out at extremely low rates of interest, these loans, that almost immediately skyrocketed to 20% or so due to tight US monetary policy in the early 80s. How during the 80s and 90s, this led to the third world debt crisis. How the IMF then stepped in to insist that in order to obtain refinancing, poor countries would be obliged to abandon price supports on basic foodstuffs or even policies of keeping strategic food reserves. They would be forced to abandon free healthcare, free education, how all of this led to the collapse of the most basic supports for some of the poorest and most vulnerable people on earth. We could consider how it led to the looting of public resources, the collapse of societies, endemic violence, malnutrition, hopelessness, and broken lives. But I don't need to mention all of that because Linger Ramatou says it all, settling Mambete's artistic debts to posterity in advance. The people of Koloban have racked up many debts in spite of your principles. So as we consider tonight a classic artwork of the postmodern era, I think of the White Lotus or Triangle of Sadness, more contemporary critiques of wealth and excessive consumption, which have captured the imaginations of the public in the last year. Written as they are from a Western perspective, they may not be as infused in natural beauty, as potent in their spiritual punch, but they both nonetheless carry the same stark warning to a humanity beset on all sides by the violence of economic inequality. If it strays too far from the collective, even the most majestic of creatures can be brought down by a pack of ravening scavengers. Enjoy the film. Mm.